so the, the first thing I'll start off with is actually, th this just came in this morning, we're publishing these uh, mini books about this subject, trying to write them together. So this will be coming out next week uh, from O'Reilly. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll, you'll see some of the blasts, uh, when it's available, where you can grab it. But what I'm going to talk to you about is, is more of that in uh, close detail or, or in uh, more, more concrete uh, a framing. And why do I think this is so important? I think one of the things that's, that's very clear, as, especially in kind of the forum and the context of the talks that are going on, in this set, uh, session is we often really over dial to the al algorithms and what they can do. But in my experience, that's not the problem. That's, that's not really, the algorithms are important, but that's not the manifestation of what makes a product win. That's not what makes a product work. If we had built some of the best algorithms around things, LinkedIn still wouldn't be amazing. The search functionality at, uh, at eBay or Google, there's a lot of places that you need product definition to help you, especially in the edge cases of where your algorithm is going to fail. And predominantly because anything you design, I guarantee will fail. There is not an algorithm out there that will work universally. And part of that is that some of the reasons I'll explain are, are the way people interpret products and how and what happens when you actually try to build something that people are gonna use. So to start the framing off, let's, let's take a second and talk about what do we mean when we say a data product. What is a data product? And the, the way I like to think about this is uh, a little bit more generically. And so to me, Google's a data product. Right? What else are other data products out there? Well, these blog posts, if any of you have checked out OkCupid, okay those are data products. It's a way of communication with data. These emails, some of you may have just gotten one this week, that tell you how many people in your network have changed jobs in the last so many days or so many years. These type of emails are, uh, not only have gotten a lot of attention, but these emails I contend have the highest click-through rate of any email that doesn't use naked people. Why? Because it's socially engaging. It's your friends, it's your people. It's in there saying, hey, Patrick got a new job? Patrick's a jerk. I'm better than Patrick. How can Patrick get a new job? No way. And then I say, Nithin? Nithin's my best friend. That's ridiculous and I don't even know what Nithin is. This is the kind of email most people are concerned about getting a click or an open, right? Really, you get these things called open rates. But here, you don't just get one click. It's a question of how many clicks. Total time of building a product like this? Seven days. All right, very fast, enormous lift for a product. So. How do we think about that as a product? Well, it's not just there and that we should restrict our, our, our vision that way. Uh, another example is on Amazon. Anytime you go to Amazon, you see these things of people who bought this, bought this. People who viewed that, bought that. Really important product. Netflix, another great example for their search and their recommendations. Even when you use iTunes and you're trying to figure out what music you should listen to, that intelligence, those are data products. They're using algorithms, they're using data, they're using your experience and feed loops to create a customized experience for you. Watson, right? That's a data product. Amazing amount of research, amazing amount of work has gone into that to beat humans. The cars, driving cars, self-autonomous vehicles, all data products. Even the, this, the new one that's about to land on Mars. So what do we think of as a data product? To me, a data product is, is a product that facilitates an end goal through data. You're using data as your mechanism to compete, your critical tactical advantage to actually build something the world wants to engage in. And by the way, many times, and what I'm going to talk a lot about today is consumer facing. But it doesn't stop there. These same ideas hold true whether it's in national security, whether it's in weather forecasting, or just building something that's an embedded chipset for a plane. The th same things hold true. The reason I'm going to talk about it primarily through the context of consumers is because probably most of you have interacted with some of these sites, so you'll have a sense of some of the things that I'm going to talk about. And by the way, if there's a question, you should interrupt and ask it. So what does it first take to build a data product, right? There's just a lot of hype around this, 
the, the data scientists and the thing, and the, the great thing is it's a perfect time to be a data scientist just because of the amount of tension that's there. If, when we think about it, you know, these, there's these kind of classic things of, well, I can't hire a data scientist, I can't get these guys. And so one of the things I always thought is fun is kind of considering, well, what do we think about data science? Have somebody seen these kind of things of, well, this is what my mom thinks and this is what I think I am. And so here's my interpretation of what it is, is for data scientists. So here's what my mom thinks I do. Here's what my friends think I do. It's pretty much just card counting. That's, that's about the extent of their understanding of it. Of course, there's what society thinks I do. It's only defined by the latest movie. There's what the rest of the company thinks I do. Or maybe in this case, maybe the venture firm. <laughs> of course, this is what I think I do. And really, this is kind of the truth of the matter at the end of the day, right? You're trying to get the data in. And of course, there's another real truth here is once you get the data, it really kind of feels like that. Right? You're just like, oh man, this, is, this isn't really what, what it, it, what's happening. So how do we kind of take all that and we position that into actually building products? So what I want to share with you is what over the last few years we distilled into a philosophy of how to work with data products. And we call this data jujitsu. And if you think about the definition of jujitsu, jujitsu is this, anybody practice jujitsu? All right, so one person can call my BS <laughs> if I make stuff up. <laughs> but this is, so this is from, the def, from Wikipedia. This is the art of softness, a method for defeating an armed opponent without using uh, weapons. And so we thought about this, and we thought, well, that's a great analogy. And if we think about it, and we think about it in a formal way, here would be our, our very long-winded, uh, something we'd write in a paper definition. Using multiple data elements and clever ways to solve iterative or auxiliary data problems when combined solve a problem that might otherwise be intractable. What does that mean? So many of you may have heard of this kind of notion of a lean startup, kind of getting out there, getting with a minimal viable product. What is the same analogy for working with a data product? One of the things that we're heavily focused on when we work with data is we try to apply the world's greatest algorithm, we try to do all this amazing stuff, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one bit. Why does it matter? Because no one gives a rat's ass about what you're building unless you know if a customer actually wants it. So you're gonna go in there, you're gonna take all this data, you're gonna put all this effort into making it work, and what's gonna happen? It's gonna flop because it turns out it wasn't even of use. The user doesn't care. So how do we step back before we put all this investment in to making an algorithm work, making all the data stuff really hardened and all the stuff working you know, real time or whatever sophistication you need, but first understand, is this a product that somebody's gonna care about? And that's really the approach is, how do you step through a methodology to get to a product that's going to win? And that's what I'm gonna walk you through is a bunch of those, those things. And to give you a sense of that, let's start off with, with an example. And so this is Jay Krepp's LinkedIn profile. So we look at his profile, it's got this nice flattering picture of Jay, it tells you about his roles at LinkedIn, it's his old role, uh, it tells you it's about something he's interested in, some of his specialties, and we can keep going down the list. It's, oh, there's books he's read, there's events he's going to, uh, there's details about where he's worked, when he's worked there, the companies he's worked at, uh, wow, even his education, and we've got websites and groups, lots and lots of great Great material. So here's a question. We need to build a recommendation system for events. Those events that we saw that, that were right up here. So we want to build a generic event recommendation system. Let's think about this from the data jujitsu perspective. How are we going to do this? Well, let's think about it first from the non-data jujitsu perspective. We go, oh, great, we got all these rich profiles. Let's go grab all that data. Let's get all those profiles. Let's do that. Let's build some. Uh, information extraction layer, let's do some disambiguation entity stuff, and we're gonna put in this great recommendation, and we're gonna apply every tool that we have, and we're gonna build out this whiz bang function. Oh, and by the way, it's gonna also work in real time. It's gonna be awesome. And then we're gonna go put it out there. How much time is that gonna take? That probably might take you a thousand man hours before you're done. Team of three. Team four people, by the time you get infrastructure, you got it all going, get it, get it working. Oh, and by the way, we have to scale it to over 100 million users. 
So a thousand hours plus to get figure out if actually anybody even cares? Well, what would be the jujitsu approach? How could we get this product built in less than 72 hours? Just using this profile information, what would be some of the clever ways that you think you might have? I've got 45 minutes. <laughs> this used to be one of our typical interview questions. How could you do this fast? Keywords. Keywords off what? Great direction. So that's a great way to start. We could look at those things. Yep. Is there a way to refine that even narrower so that we have a faster way of matching that, along that, uh, that notion of matching on, on the form of keywords, where there might be a more crisp ontology? Limit to a vertical. Yeah, there you go. I tried to hire Paco many times, so <laughs> he gets a leg up here. <laughs> so think about it for a second. Right now, part of it is as you think about as you go into your brain, like why are you stuck on this? Is it because you don't have coffee, or is it because you're thinking most of the day you've been thinking about it algorithmically? Think about cheating. How would you cheat? We look at this profile. What's right above it? I gave the answer right to you. There's books. Books have ISBN numbers. ISBN numbers have a cataloging system right next to it. Why don't we just take the books and the ISBN numbers and then same way take the events which have equivalent cataloging and a number of different systems, Lanyard for example, one, and we'll just match those up against each other. Now what we could do is we could build an ad module that just displays this on a bunch of people's pages real quick and get a sense of does anybody actually want this functionality. 72 hours, we're good, we know if people even care. From that, then we can ask ourselves, oh, should we actually build this? Because the technological choices you use to actually make this algorithm are heavily determined by what the user wants. In this case, does it need to be refreshed every two minutes? Probably not, so real time isn't gonna matter. Is it gonna need to be refreshed every day? Well, it depends how many events are coming in. All right. Those are the kind of the ways to think about the Jitsu approach. Going the low friction, easy to get out there, fast test, and then go ahead and build something more concrete. So as we think through that, let me just go back over here. Let's, let me tell you a little about, these are, I wanna walk through some of the lessons I wish I knew uh, that we discovered as a team really going, going through and building products over the last uh, few years. Uh, and I'm gonna walk through these, and many of these will be LinkedIn context ones, so I'll be able to give you a little bit more context, but I can give you plenty of other ones. But the key thing to remember is in this model of doing Dao Jiu Jitsu, you have to think of that building your products is an arc. It's a strategic arc of progression. You're not trying to go climb Mount Everest today. You need to do a bunch of training runs before you get up there and go to that. And I'll walk you through exactly that. And the first part of that is going to always ask is, what data do you start with? What's structured, what's unstructured? And of that mixture, what do you want? What can you do with that? What are the limitations of that? And to give you an example of that, what I contend is that data cleanup is the problem. It is the majority problem and when we see new data scientists and it doesn't just have to be LinkedIn it's wherever the number one thing that they they have to get adjusted to right away is recognizing that 80% of the work is going to be cleaning up the data no matter what so when we think about LinkedIn companies right, and we think about somebody's arbitrary profile in their companies how many versions of IBM do you think there are in LinkedIn 50 100 Try like 4,000, 6,000, probably even close to 8,000 now. Why? Why so many? Well, you got IBM, TJ Watson Lab, IBM Almaden, SPSS, Matiza. You've got all these things that need to go there. Now, should, should you just build a system where when you, log, you try to add a profile, it should be a drop down? Ugh, God, could you imagine how long that would be, how horrible that would be? Should you force people saying, sorry, that's not in the system, find another answer? No, because should I tell you, if you work for Natiza, that you have to call yourself IBM? 
It's your profile. You should be able to say how you want to be represented. So how are we going to fix this? How do you fix this problem? Instead of doing it. Now, one way we could do it is we could say, oh, you know what? We'll look at network overlap, and then we'll figure out how people are connected together. And then we'll be able to disambiguate. it. OK, that's an idea. Oh, wait, we could use email addresses that, that they have, and we'll look at that. Oh, that's interesting. But think about what you're trying to do. What I contend you're trying to do is you're trying to think of the problem as true data people. And that's a flaw. Now, why make that type of statement? The reason that's a flaw is because that's 100 to 1,000 times more expensive than thinking about it as a product person. What does a product person do? He said, oh, you know what? We could change the user flow. So maybe we should put type ahead in there. So as soon as you start typing in IBM, it gives you just IBM, so you don't say IBM uh, Almaden. Right? Maybe it's when you start typing, it says, oh, did you mean maybe something else? Right? And so you're more likely to click on that. Finally, if you enter something and you don't like it, maybe it says, hey, you know, we can't find that in the system. Can you give us the URL for your company? That's a great marker. And then maybe it says, oh, we can you know, also give us your stock symbol or those types of things. Now you're taking a back end problem and you're making it a front end problem, thereby making your back end, your, anything you're going to do later on building on top of it, much more robust, much more crisp. And that's part of the trick here, is to actually make all that back-end stuff front-end problems so they disappear and help your problem get better. And part of this that people also miss is one of the key things of doing this jujitsu approach is using data augmentation. And human, uh, the, these ideas like Mechanical Turk and companies like Crowdflower and these types, I think are becoming more and more critical. I'll give you an example of this. One of uh, my favorite examples of a company that uh, did a very great job of, of this data jiu-jitsu approach is they sold a product and it's a camera that you install in a restaurant corner. And you, when you install this camera, it looks out across the things and they tell you every so many minutes how many tables are clean or dirty. Fantastic information for a restaurant owner. Really amazing stuff. And when you think about it, think about that, that problem, how to actually calculate that, that visual components, like a few napkins on the table, is that dirty, is that clean? But here's the thing, what these guys did is they had an amazing kind of marketing campaign and all this stuff. What are they doing? They're just sending every image so many seconds to Mechanical Turk and asking some human to count how many tables are clean or dirty. That's it. That's brilliant to me. Why is it brilliant? So you know, from a technology perspective, it's like, that's cheating. But now you actually know if anybody wants to buy your product or not. Before you go out and you invest thousands of hours, millions of dollars in R&D trying to build this thing that nobody cares about. Or maybe you turn out, you go out and you talk to customers and you realize, hey, you know the market cap for this is only like $20 million. That's not really a great business that you want to be in. But in that process, you learn about, oh, you know what? The real thing we need to do is actually for parking lots and maybe how many parking stalls are open. Maybe that's the real money winner. The point is, is that you can have a product very quickly. And you did in this process, you're using no data, but you're using that aspect to frame and bound your data problem. And by doing that, you make your data problem easier overall. You're constraining it. Oh, let me tell you an example here of, uh, of a great one, which is, I think, in, uh, we, let's suppose we have a bunch of profiles. Could be anywhere. And let's say we want to ask, uh, which set is of these are fraudulent and which ones are good? And we're starting it from this from scratch. We haven't looked at this. What's a classic data approach? We're going to build some, you know, the usual kind of things of uh, the entity extractors, the information extractors, all that stuff. And we're going to put some classifier on this, and we're going to have a training set, and we're going to do all this amazing stuff, right? Wow! Once again, we're at lots and lots of man hours. Instead, what we could do is we could take a set of profiles and give those to humans. And we're just going to give a snippet so that you could tell instantly with a glance if this is a good or a bad profile. So why? Because maybe the person's name is ASDFE, right? All just kind of hitting the keyboard randomly. You'll be able to tell right away. Now, let's say we're going to send it to three people. So all three of them say, yes, that's fraudulent. Great. We're very clear cut. If all three say, no, it's clean, we're also good. But let's suppose there's some difference in opinion. What do we do? 
Well, now we know, hey, maybe we should add a little more information and try again. We'll send it out to another three people with some more information. Maybe now we have a good information or not. Or maybe we have this again. But here's the trick. In this process, what we are doing is we are very quickly both creating training sets as well as increasing our own internal sophistication about the nature of the data problem. Because every time we get one of these votes, we're getting to go actually look at data, actually having our own eyeballs on the data to understand what the problems are. And then we can construct an algorithm very quickly to replicate or remove a lot of this other process that humans were doing previously. So we're able to actually replace our human scaling with our technology scaling. But because we're starting with human scaling, we have a very crisp definition of the problem. All right. The next part, build the easy products first. Can't emphasize this enough. Many times like, I'll talk to somebody and they say, oh, I'd like to build that. My PhD advisor, Jim York, uh, used to have this great saying to me, because I used to do this all the time. And he'd come to me and say, oh, we should do this. And he'd say, simple problems become complex. Complex problems become impossible, if not intractable. That's true is a general speaking of almost everything, especially data products. Because as you build them, the simple things, there's going to be all sorts of nuances. Like a great simple one here is, is Amazon's. The, uh, the collaborative filter, right? And think about all the things that are still gonna go wrong in such a simple product. Because if you look at some of my collaborative filters, you can tell very clearly what I look at is Thomas the Train toys. Uh, well, is that really? Because now if I go, what's the next thing that I'm gonna go search for, right? There's this, the, you, you, in fact, if you look for funny uh, Amazon recommendations, you'll get all these kind of crazy results. Because when the tail, you know, the sparsity of data kills you in this product. So how do you handle that? How do you handle refreshing this data? How do you handle making it repeatable? How do you handle making this a, a, a good relevancy problem? All of those things become incredibly important, especially when you apply scale at the end of this. And so as you think about this, this simple problem becomes complex. Now, the other thing I want to mention about this product, which I think is incredibly important, is as a data product, is because we like to think about these things algorithmically, the first thing most people would think of is, if from an Amazon perspective, you say, oh, you know what? We should build a recommender for products for you. And that's gonna be really sophisticated, it'll be awesome, and it's gonna have this great user flow. But what really is the problem? The real problem that Amazon has, when you get to a product page for the very first time, what are your two options that you can do? There's only actually three options. There's three options you can do when you get to an Amazon page if it doesn't have this. What are they? You could buy the item. You could go search for another item. Or you can close the window. That's it. Those are your three product choices. Now, you could say, oh, we should drop you in a recommender system and do that. Now, when was the last time you walked into a store when you would go to Fry's and you go pick up like headphones? that you walked up and you started checking out the headphones and somebody walked up to you right away and was like, can I help you? Can I give you product recommendations? If that actually happened at Fry's, you might be creeped out, right? That, that is it's so rare. That, think about that from a perspective. What are you used to really doing when you go to check out those, those headphones? What's the very first thing you do? Do you just walk out the store picking them up? Very rarely. Almost every time is you're gonna look up to the one right above it, right to the right, right below, right over, maybe see what else is on that, that aisle. You're gonna take it over, look at the back, think about if, wow, wouldn't it be great if there's recommendations here, maybe try to check, compare prices, do all that stuff. No matter what, you always look around you. So how do you replicate your real world experience into the actual framing of a data product? Because you don't have all that real estate. So the problem that's really important for the user is not the job recommender, or sorry, the, job, the, the product recommender. What the real thing is, is liquidity. That's what the user wants. We think it's product recommendations. They want subtle product recommendations through liquidity of other options. 
What's the way to actually do that? Collaborative filtering is the cheapest, lightest way to actually get it out there and test it. It also gives you massive bang for the buck because of that problem of the three options that you have, either close the window, search, or buy, this is giving you another way to actually spend time on their site, giving you a chance to win the customer. Now you may say, oh, that's easy for Amazon. They've got lots of customers, they got something. But when you're starting off, if you don't have that, you are going to lose. One of the great products that LinkedIn built very early on was people who viewed this profile also viewed that profile. Massive dramatic lift in the amount of page views. Almost every product that has done this gets a lift. YouTube does this. Right? Why do they do this? Because you're fighting against, in a consumer world, people closing the window. Similarly, another example of that, well, actually, yeah, let's, so the, 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 another story of this is the people we may know functionality. And the quick story, some of you may have heard this, is the quick story of people may know is it was actually an idea that was created at LinkedIn uh, by a Stanford alumni here, uh, Jonathan Goldman uh, and Steve Stegman. And the, the idea here was a very natural one. When you first got here to this conference, right, and you did the thing, what's the very first thing you do when kind of everyone's hanging out together? Do you feel totally comfortable? Or do you kind of do that walk around the outside? You're like, yeah, and they're like, oh, yeah, I've seen you before. Yeah, we're on the circuit together, <laughs> right? Finally, you like talk to somebody, and then like you sit there and you hang out and you talk to each other, and then you're like, God, I don't know anybody else, but I don't know anyone else to talk to, so I'm just gonna talk to this person. Right? We have that kind of feeling of aloneness. We don't actually know what's there. So think about this, the same experience when the first time you get to a social network site. The very first time, it's the exact same thing, except there's a big, big difference. It's like the lights are off. You can't see across the room, you can't see anybody. And there's another big problem, is you can teleport away instantly because you close the browser window. Those two things combined are massive, uh, will basically drop your funnel of, of being able to actually make your product work. Now, think about also that moment once you've been here for a day and you kind of saw everyone again this morning, you're like, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh yeah, we had dinner last night, oh, that's great. You start talking, how much more comfortable do you feel being in this environment, right? When you know people, your feeling and your, the way you interpret the product changes dramatically. So what people you may know does is it replicates that. It makes you feel, you get to say, oh, geez, Mike is on this site? Of course, I trust Mike. Yeah, I'll be here, I'm gonna hang out too. Suddenly you're changing the amount of possible friction for the product. Now, how do you build this, right? Well, the algorithm, it's real simple. We could build all sorts of craziness, but why? Why don't we just say, what are the exact three questions that we always ask somebody when you meet them for the first time? So what do you do? Where do you work? Where do you live? Great, congrats, you know people you may know now. All right? We could also do triangle closing. I know Paco, I know Michael. Michael probably should know Paco. There we go. Now, how do you actually build this and do the Jiu-Jitsu approach? You write that lightweight algorithms. Does it need Hadoop? No, this original version was actually written on Oracle. Lightweight. What he did is they cut it, they built it as an ad unit. So every person on the site got a unique ad of their three recommendations of people I may know. Those three kind of versions of recommendation. And so if you clicked on that recommendation there for Kevin, it would take you to the connection page. Of course, you know, you'd use the site so many times, you might see this ad again, it's still gonna show Kevin. But here's the point. Many people in the organization didn't think this was a priority item to work on. Why? Because they're focused on scalability or building other products, so this was kind of an experiment. But the thing of, of building it and applying this way showed massive lift. The click-through rate was astonishing. Because the click-through rate was astonishing, everyone said, oh my gosh, we have a winner. Because of that, we said, oh, we gotta build this more as a built-out product. It shouldn't just be an ad slide. It should have functionality. It should have all sorts of other stuff. It should refresh. And then we hit the issue of like, oh, this isn't gonna scale on Oracle. So we tried it on Greenplum, we tried it on Aster, and eventually moved it to Hadoop. The point was we didn't actually know what we were truly building as a product, as a winner, until we had tested it out and gotten some traction. And part of that was as soon as we had launched this, everyone else recognized 
the power of it. Very quickly, Facebook adopted it. And in fact, scaled it more quickly. It was the X fact now it's one of the dominant ways that you see of any new user experience on a social network. The point being is we started with this lightweight data jiu-jitsu approach to actually make the product work. And also the other part here is that was to emphasize is that in that process, we are also grounding ourselves in our products in reality. We have an analogy of being in a room for the first time with people. Similarly, be opportunistic for wins. These, uh, if, if you haven't gotten your LinkedIn graph, you can actually get one if you go do a search for LinkedIn and InMaps, I-N-M-A-P-S. You can get this great map of your network. And so this is mine. And it's got kind of all of these kind of great colors. This is produced uh, uh, with uh, Pete Skomarach, uh, Matthew Bastion, uh, and a bunch of other guys who came up with this kind of great idea. Now, how did we make this a product? Well, we thought, oh, wouldn't it be just kind of cool? And it was just like, it was literally a hack day event. And when we had this, we had one of the really fascinating things is we had these things and we went literally around to the company with an iPad and just say, hey, just put in your member ID and they print out their poster and people were like, this is amazing. And we, people were just comparing them and playing with them. And so what we did is we went out and we just, printed out a bunch for bloggers and influential people. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, that's the power of the network. I get it. Now, all of a sudden, everyone's talking about us. We've suddenly used data as a mechanism to explain the value proposition of a product. Very quickly, this ended up as a full piece spread in uh, Fast, uh, Fast Company as it got linked in into the, one of the most innovative companies list. Appeared on the, on the front cover of the S1 filing for the IPO. This also, we said, hey, you know what? This would be kind of cool as a product. We rolled this out at Strata Conference where anybody could walk up to a booth and put it in and you'd get your own map there. Suddenly, what is happening at a conference? Everyone at the conference is taking a printout of their LinkedIn map and saying, let me see your map, let me see your map. Who do you think is dominating the conversation at that conference all of a sudden? We are. And the, think about that for a second. How many hours are we putting into this versus being opportunistic but thinking of it as a product? So all of a sudden, we can take a little ideas of data and we're turning those into product aspects to really win. Now, similarly with these blog posts, OkCupid okay, I think is the high watermark for doing these blogs. This is the one on the mathematics of beauty. One of the other ones I love is they're being very clever with their data where they, they, they officially have information about the context of how often they ask questionnaires, like how often are you having sex? And then they also look at your devices. So are you using iOS, Android, uh, RIM, uh, maybe Microsoft these days? Uh, and what they show is they said, hey, you know what would be fun is we noticed that iPhone users seem to be having sex a lot more often than Android users. Uh, Blackberry users are a lot less, and there's these monks known as the Microsoft guys. And so what do they do? They write this up as a blog post. And all of a sudden, they get all the major newspapers writing about them and talking about that and all that fun information. It also goes in a big way to explain the product. Because the product is not eHarmony. It's a product that is designed for a younger audience, people who are interested in dating. And so it kind of has that fun humor angle. A similar example of that was this one, uh, Monica Rogati did this, about the rise of uh, the uh, job title Ninja. And if we put this graph together here, and it shows that Ninja's growth on LinkedIn, and uh, of course there's, don't be, a, don't be in a, being an evangelist is okay, but don't be a guru. Now here's the thing that's the most important thing about this. This gets you both the home page of the Wall Street Journal and the front page of the Wall Street Journal. You can't buy that type of real estate for your product. You can't get that stuff. And so we've taken a little bit of data and turned it. One of the things I was most surprised by, the, one of the all-time best performing one of these, where I was completely wrong, because I thought of this from the data. I was like, people want to see something interesting. They want to actually understand stuff. That's just not true. Go pick up USA Today. <laughs> right. What's most important to sing? Top 10 buzzwords in your LinkedIn profile. I thought, there is no way people will be interested in this. I was absolutely wrong. Simple, simple things like that are crazy powerful. What should you name your kid if you want them to be CEO, right? 
It turns out it's four letters. If you want them to be a salesperson, it's three letters. It's six, I think six letters if you want them to be an engineer. Uh, I'm two letters, so who knows what that says. <laughs> uh, but the point is here is that you're using data in very clever ways to do this. Similarly, we did this one on uh, where people went after the collapse of the financial industry and got us lots of traction. Giving data back to the user is incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful driver for interaction. This is uh, LinkedIn's Who Viewed My Profile. This is uh, an older version. It gives you all sorts of great details there on the left-hand side of how the people that are looking at you. You've got different graphs and all sorts of things. And now as data people go, that's it? That's all you're going to give me? I, guys, I know you've got this data science team and you've got all this amazing stuff. What the heck? Why aren't you doing something more powerful? You should give us something better. And so you're right. We should give you something. But here's what I contend. Data vomit is bad. And all of us, our notion of what we think is acceptable data is very, very poor for the rest of the world. And here's why. This is what we came up with is what we think is a good data product from our perspective as data people. Look at it, it's got, oh, here's all the viewers, here's my profile views over time, like a stock ticker symbol, there's percentage, there's companies, there's industries, there's titles, there's regions, schools, and all this is drill down capability. It's phenomenal, really amazing stuff. And by the way, the technology on the back end of this, ridiculously good stuff. Updates in real time, very, very fast counters, very slick stuff built by Chris Riccamini. Guess how many clicks this gets? It's a real easy answer, zero. Zero clicks. Well, I, I clicked on it because I knew it had functionality, so maybe one. But why? Why does it get zero clicks? Where are you supposed to click? You've got so much information, you're paralyzed. There's, in fact, an inverse law when you display data. When you display data, the more you display is inversely propor proportional to the amount of engagement you'll see on the product. Think about this for a second with the story of MapQuest. You guys remember MapQuest, precursor to Google Maps? MapQuest was originally a product out of uh, Cornell, an amazing, amazing GIS technology. And it was really used by only two groups. One was Democrats, the others were Republicans. And they used it to gerrymander against each other. And so they thought, well, this is such great stuff. Shouldn't more people should use this? And the web was just starting to take off. And they said, wait, we should build Maybe we should build a kind of a lightweight web app. And so he said, oh, well, here's maybe a way to actually look at your area. And so he built a, the, what really became MapQuest. And if you look at those early forms of MapQuest versus today, very little has changed. Some of the stuff that's changed is the way you actually, you can see traffic, of course, but you, can, you, can, uh, you don't have to drag anymore. You just have to click. Right? So now you can drag. But here's the thing. If you show a new user for the very first time Google Maps, clear your cache, try it. What does it do? It'll have a little thing that says drag here. You can drag this. Why? Because users, when they see this map, they're just like, whoa, it's information. And they don't do anything. And then they're like, where's the arrows? How do I move? They navigate. And you're like, duh, drag. People won't do it. And so be very careful of how much data you put on a page. Distill it down. The other part of this is, is what I think of as data vomit is most times when we're building data products, especially in the health space right now, we're seeing a lot of things where it says, great, here's a bunch of data and it's like, so what? What am I supposed to do? I have this sleep band that I use uh, and I'm just beta testing a new one and last night I looked at it and go, great, I slept like crap again last night. Thanks. I didn't really need the device to tell me that. I, so what is that doing? Part of what they're doing is they're servicing data. Yes, interesting. But it's not sufficient just to do that. You have to provide some way of making it actionable. Otherwise, it's just data vomit. All right, data exposing data exposes very unique challenges. This is a short video that I think explains it better. Like Tebow thinks I'm gay. What's Tebow? It's a device that records television shows that you pick. And then based on what you pick, it records other shows that it thinks you like. You record Star Trek, Tebow assumes you like that kind of thing. And then when you're not home, it records the X-Files. So what's the problem? I had it record Will and Grace, a couple episodes of Ellen. Right away, the damn thing thinks I'm gay. Keeps recording queer as folk every episode. Last night, it recorded a Judy Garland movie. <laughs> call the company. Just tell them you're not gay. I want to be there when you make that call. Exactly. 
I actually tried to outfox it, get it to go the other way. I had it record MTV Spring Break, Playboy After Dark, swimsuit competitions. Thing won't budge. Insists I'm gay. It's a problem. While funny in a sitcom, this is actually based on a true blog post where a guy posted about this exact similar experience. And the problem we've all faced is where we go, oh, this job recommendation or this this movie recommendation, or this restaurant is terrible. It's terrible. And part of that is that feeling. And so let me give, walk you through an example of this. There's a product on LinkedIn where, uh, actually, I'll just do it right here. Uh, is there's you can get job recommendations on LinkedIn, and so it gives you a list, and there's a bunch of stuff. And think about that for a second. If I recommend a job for you, and 99 of them can be dead on accurate, but one of them is going to say, hey, this job is in, well, let's pick on Missouri today. Let's say it's in Missouri, and you're like, what the hell is that? I'm not moving to Missouri, this is terrible. Or maybe instead of saying it's SVP for analytics, it's gonna say it's a entry level job. And you're like, I'm not an entry level person. This is terrible. What happens is, is when you display recommendations for a person, one result out of 100 will tank your entire experience for a product. People remember bad things. They don't remember the good ones. How, how good is the weather? As Soon as I said that statement, did you just think about like, oh, wow, the weather's really nice today? Or do you think about, oh, yeah, I can't believe they screwed up the weather forecast last Saturday, right? We remember the bad predictions, the bad recommendations, and so it overdrives to the user. And so oftentimes we think of this notion of uh, precision and recall. Precision and recall almost have to be flipped when you think about them in ads versus exposing data directly to a user. You have to overgear to precision. But here's the challenge. Most times when you're gearing to precision, you're going to fail because it's subjective. For example, I say, hey, we should, you ever do that game like you're sitting around and it's like, hey, we should go get dinner. And you say, well, what would you like to get? You say, oh, what about Thai? And you're like, no, not Thai. And somebody says, oh, what about Mexican? No, I'm not Mexican. And so I said, oh, what about Chinese? Yeah, Chinese. You're like, I just said Thai. <laughs> what, what's wrong with that? You're like, yeah, but you know, the Thai place I was thinking of, I don't like the ambiance there. It's too busy. It takes too long to get a table. So when you think about that, same way for a job recommender, if I'm gonna say, recommend, you know, I can't hire Tommy, show me all the people like Tommy, what does that mean? Is it because they're a great networker in the company? They're really heads down, get a lot of work done? They're really incredibly insightful? What is it? And so this notion of taste starts to show up, the subjectivity. And so what you actually have to do is you have to give users a bailout flow. You have to give them a way that they are fundamentally in control of the product. And the way to explain that, that and give you an example of that is by setting expectations of the user. And think about these two systems. You guys remember the IBO, that Sony dog? Right? So it's a little dog and it kind of walks around. It's a data product. It uses a lot of sensors and everything and it walks into a wall. Do you kick it? You know, if it falls over, do you curse at it? Do you stomp on it? It's a dog, it's got floppy ears. How can you hate it? It's kind of, kind of cute in that sort of bizarro way, right? Now, you ever call you an airline company? What do you do? It's like, you start to talk to them, you're like, seriously, you want me to call? Of course I'm calling from the terminal where it's loud and you keep saying, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. And so you're like, agent, representative, operator, human. You know, you start pressing buttons like crazy. You're trying to figure out what the hell that happened. Do you ever at the end of that experience go, that was good, same time tomorrow? No, why? Because the setting, one's a dog. The other is pure friction in your product. Think of that dog instead was a robot bringing you coffee and it spilled it on you. You might kick it, <laughs> you might curse it, <laughs> right? Functionality of the product is really critical. The same way, a great example of this is what Pandora used to do, is they used to give you a thumbs up and thumbs down, where if you said thumbs up, it'd be like, yay, so happy, we're so glad you like it. Or if you said thumbs down, it'd be like, oh, we're so sorry, we'll never ever do that again. What is it doing? It's not being the overlord. It's not trying to be the overlord data. It's supposed to be the dumb, silly dog. And by making your data products and building it so that it's a way that has a proddy embellishment of feeling soft and fuzzy and stupid, 
you are giving yourself a competitive advantage for your algorithms in those edge cases that fail because of subjectivity. And that's a way of combining the product element with the data element to give yourself a way of winning. Because your product and your algorithm could be awesome, but because one time you are off means that you don't get to play again. Let's see what else I have. Oh uh, yes, uh, with a little twist, you can make relevancy, hard relevancy problems easy. This is that job recommender that I was talking about. So what we did here is instead of taking the job recommendations, we said, oh man, people really don't like these because of this, this subjectivity issue. So what we said is, you know what? We're gonna take, let's, we're gonna take Paco's job recommendations. And instead of giving them to Paco, we're gonna give it to his network. And we're gonna ask his network to say, if you see, see, help your connections find a job at LinkedIn. And so we're gonna send it to him through his friends. Because now, if I forward this job to Paco, Paco's gonna think two things. One, DJ's a real ass. I can't believe he's sending me stuff like this. Or two, it's like, well, DJ must know something about this that I don't really see, so I'm gonna check it out. Never in that process is, does he think, there must be some terrible algorithm behind this. The algorithm is abstracted and you're using humans as a product way to completely solve your relevancy problem. What happens in the process is now you're able to take that, that, that aspect of it, the data that's coming in, and build that into your, your recommendation system for better relevancy. Oh, and uh, one important thing, there's very different development cycle for data products. Data products, because data products will pass through QA in perfect sense, right? The data flows and everything and all the code is great and you've white box and black box tested it. But the problem is data when it comes together looks funky. A great example of this is this product here, LinkedIn Skills. And LinkedIn Skills, it has all this great stuff. It says like ballet, it's, there's a definition from Wikipedia, here's professionals related skills, you've got jobs, related companies, relative growth, all this amazing stuff, really fantastic stuff. Let's think about Cobalt. Now suddenly Cobalt, the language, the metal, what is that? So what happens is when you bring data feeds together from different elements, LinkedIn, Wikipedia, other job sites, everything, and you start putting it together, oftentimes, you can only tell that things don't make sense when a human looks at it and you go, oh, that doesn't make any sense, right? And so what you have to do in one of the ways we did this, how do we solve this? You take a bunch of screenshots, you put it into CoverFlow on the MacBook and you just start tabbing through them and you're like, okay, which one of these makes sense? You send it out to Mechanical Turk, the human augmentation I was talking about, and then you look through it there to actually figure out what's good and what's bad from a human perspective. Because at this time, there is no great way to QA. It is still an incredibly open problem of how do you QA when data feeds come together, especially when there's data holes or data gaps or data overlaps. Know when to build the serious stuff. In LinkedIn, there's a job recommendation. If you post a job, you get the 50 best recommendations. This product started off in this lean methodology of data jitsu. It first started off as a hack, was became, Monica originally put it together. It was this product that if when you posted a job, we'd send, we kind of just send you an email. We said, oh, that's cool, that's cool. Send you an email saying, hey, we're testing the system, want to just see if these recommendations are interesting. And it turned out people really loved it. Well, the way we found out that people loved it was one day Monica was out, and so she didn't bring her laptop in, and I got this irate phone call from one of the sales guys saying, what the hell, how come the system's down? I was like, no system's down, everything's green. What are you talking about? And he kept on yelling, and I was like, wait a second, what did you sell? And he realized, oh my God, the sales guy has been selling something that's a prototype and people love it. Oh, we better really do something about that. We better build that as a product. So we built it as a product. Of course, we said, oh, we shouldn't just send it like 24 hours. We should try to send it, you know, more regularly, like maybe every, once within every hour. And so we built the system in Hadoop, got the times down. We got it much more compressed. And then as we're doing that, we're like, oh, you know what? It'd be really great to get this down in a 15 minute interval. Can we do that? Yeah, let's do that. And then the product, as we're sort of thinking about it, we realize we need to do this as an integrated flow where as soon as you come in, you might get recommendations and they give you matches and there's these cards and if you disappear a card, another burn pops up and how cool would that be? We're like, that would be cool. And oh my God, do we have to rebuild everything because now everything has to work in real time. But here's the thing, now we know exactly what to build because we did a progressive arc 
through this product. We're able to actually figure out what we're trying to go hit collectively together. And that is the whole trick of this game, is to think about it both in this jujitsu approach as well as to build it as a strategic arc. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually cut things a little bit short here. A lot of this is, is in the new book uh, that comes out next week, or the mini book, uh, and it'll be free. And um, yeah. I don't know if we have time for things.